Welcome back to episode two. So in this episode, we are going to start the whole mixing process. Um, we're going to have to jump around a bit because it's not a linear thing. You can't just go, okay, now my drums are finished. Yay. And now my guitars are finished. Yay. And now my bass is finished. Yay. And now my vocals are finished. And it makes everything interacts with one another. What frequencies you use, what things sound like, what needs to be accentuated, all these things come together. There's also an aspect of um, riding the faders, you know, where you want the guitars to go a bit louder and the drums to go softer and all these little things start to happen. So it's not as simple as just saying, okay, now I'm going to fix my drums and now I'm going to fix my guitar. So the process that I like to work with is I like to get everything into a state that I like. So I want the drums to sound the way I want them to. I want the guitars to sound the way I want them to. Then the bass and then the vocals. But unfortunately, then some things will clash. So you have to then go back in and make minor adjustments. For the sake of speed and um, for the sake of um, not drawing this out too much, I'm going to jump around in a certain way. I'm going to do the drums today just with Easy Drummer. What I do quickly to get Easy Drummer, for example, or the drums, the MIDI drums, to sound good and usable. And then get the guitars to fit in that and the bass to fit in that. Now, most of the time, the guitars and the drums are more important than the bass, the sound, the tone. So um, usually when you record, you record, uh, well, most people do it like that, they record the drums, then they record the bass, then they record the guitars. But I actually flip it, I actually record the drums, then the guitars, and then the bass. The only exception would be if you record live and you have the opportunity for a good bassist and a good drummer to record their tracks together. That is the ideal scenario for that rhythm section to really gel. But because we're doing everything in the box, we're doing the classic home recording, home studio version of this song, um, practically it's better to do the guitars before the bass. One of the reasons is, um, basses tend to be a little bit shitter musicians. I am not a great bass player, so if I did the bass first, I might be I might be out. So I record the guitars first and then I try to make sure after the fact that when I do the bass that it fits with both the drum, you know, the nice rhythmic um, gelling of the drums, but that I don't do something countering the guitars. Now, this is obviously not a rule. Everything I tell you is not a rule. This is how I do it. Um, and this is what works practically. And I think there's some good suggestions in there. If you're a grand knowledgeable bass player and guitar player and you know all the scales and notes and roots and fucking keys and whatever, you do it any which one. But I do it this way. Right? I do the guitars first. Um, because I like a certain type of high gain guitar or kind of mid gain guitar I want to make sure that the bass supports that and I also want to make sure that the bass supports the rhythm so I'm trying to both and that's why I actually do the the bass last and sometimes I like to keep to because I really love bass I think that in a song bass is really important same as with drums um, I like, again, this is a personal thing, that's why it's kind of counters what I said before, but I like the bass to also be not just a rhythm instrument, but also have some influence on the melody here and there, or kind of strains the melody or pushes it in a certain way. So I do the bass second. So what we're going to do quickly is just m mess around with easy drummer. So we're going to make some decisions here. Um, I'm just going to solo the drums. So I think what we chose is... Now, an, another excuse I have to make, I'm doing this so that I've got less... 
fucking around with the video I have to mix on my earphones so what you're hearing is not gonna be brilliant I'll probably do some after the video I'll probably put the monitors on and just fine tweak it because mixing with headphones just isn't my thing so here we go So as you can hear, the drums sound brilliant, right? They just sound great. Easy drummer, straight out the box, put it on, it just sounds fucking A. But it doesn't sound fucking A in the mix. Classic, classic, classic problem. Um, I've had a bit of a mess around with it, and I know why. Um, they do a lot of things which makes it sound great, and I think it's a bit of a sales pitch, to be honest. But from an actual mixing point of view, it, it doesn't gel out the box at all um, and I think that's logical it, it can't because it doesn't know what it's going to be mixed with at the end of the day so what I like to do is I actually like to use the uh, prog rock um, preset You can hear that the bass drum is way too high. Look at that. Jesus. Um, there's too much reverb. The overheads are always a bit too high. I like the toms kind of high because if the toms go, I like them to be accentuated. Get the delay, delay down a bit. Um, now we're going to do another version of this and you'll see what difference that makes. Now out of the box, because it's a prog rock setting, it doesn't have some of the um, toms in there. So I'm going to put the toms in. Now I specifically choose the top one and I'll explain why that happens later. And I'm going to do exactly the same here. Because I, I am most likely going to be mixing two full drum kits and then to prevent any um, phase issues, especially on the cymbals, um, they need to be entirely different samples that get pulled up when it plays back. Okay, I'm happy with that. I'm just gonna leave it like that for now. We will get back into the drums later on. The next thing I'm going to check out is the guitars. And I'm just going to play one back. It was Now the, the, the guitar that I'm playing back here, obviously if you have recorded um, a, 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 an amp and cab, things like that are going to be different. I'm still going to have a quick check at the sound I'm trying to get out. Using Amplitube or any kind of um, bias or anything like that um, is fine, but you will, just like you would in a studio, you would find the guitar tone that you want. Okay. The the first thing about recording anything, uh, drums, snare, guitar, bass, everything is that the first thing you want to know is that the sound that's coming from your amp is the one that you're after. In this modern age of being able to reamp and all that shit, you you've got 50 million decisions to uh, that you opening yourself up to later, which is fine if you've got millions of time, but actually I know I'm doing a punky rock song, so I know roughly what sound I'm after. Make sure that's a good one and go for it. Now, we are going to freeze these tracks because they, again, in, for my ears, they mix better after the fact if you, if you, if you um, freeze them. There's also certain things that the amp doesn't do, like when you've got fade-ins and fades-out. Because you've got high distortion, it kind of doesn't do a fade-in. It tries to amplify that low signal 
from the fade in so you don't get that nice curvy fade in so when you freeze them and you chop them up you can do nice fades in and out without having to use complex um, uh, um, fader optimization fader optimization is great but it's massively over complex for certain scenarios where you just want simple kind of fades in and fades out so what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and get a nice sound out of the amps and then freeze the tracks so I can chop them up and do whatever fades in fades out that I, that I want when it comes to amplitude um, or any VSTs uh, or even monitoring a live amp through your headphones try to put it into one ear so either left or right when you're listening to it, it you get a better idea of the sound of it than having it in stereo in both ears so this is what we're going to do here Another decision I usually make quite early on is which cab and microphones to use. This is the dynamic, uh, what is it called, the, um, the, 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 the 421. Um, this is a Royer Ruben clone. And I usually put them just off. Depending on the cab, I just put them just off. One on the cone and one just off. Typical classic, nothing weird about it. <laughs> So in this amp, I get a nice, that screechy high end, um, and I've cut off quite a bit of this. Um, one of the reasons you cut off a lot of lows um, on the guitar early on is because you know when you get into the chugging business, you're going to have all this 200 hertz build up, um, and a lot of the low end is not required. You do need that 100 and 125, absolutely, but that low end, you don't really don't need. So if you cut off a little bit beforehand, it shouldn't be a problem. It means you have to EQ less later on. Because it's high gain, I'm not using any compression because I'm going to bust these and then compress everything at the same time. So the main left and right rhythm channels are exactly um, are, are the same amp. So I'm going to delete this one and replace it with the one I just did here. So we'll turn this back to, what was it, 60, 70? Seventy. Okay. Now from a gain staging point of view, um, I have some videos out about gain staging, making sure that your DI signal is good, then you want to get the DI signal. Uh, again, I'm, I'm duplicating things now, but um, this is important. Um, you want your input level here to be fairly good, I would say half to three quarters, because this is the level that goes into your amp, etc, um, etc. Et so gain staging is massively important, making sure you always get nice, good levels. Now, they'll go, oh, it can be soft, it can be loud, I don't agree. I think it makes your life easier um, if you have, um, I'm going to zoom into these, if you have signals that are, I would say, three quarters from a visual point of view on your door. And I'm saying this from a visual point of view because if in the beginning when you start out, this is the best reference that you've got is how good is my gain staging, how good are my, uh, how good are my tracks. How well are they recorded? Um, so if you look at these, they're all kind of, nothing is peaking, nothing is flattening out, right? So I've got no clipping, but I've got a nice, good, decent signal uh, in the bass, in the vocals. Um, they're all, they're all nice and, see that? These are good signals. So um, I'm not going to have any issues. I don't have to gain anything up. I don't have to maximize any volumes, anything like that. 
all the volume, all the gain staging. Take care, you can use on the path, you use your, your, your gain staging on your interface, on your amp, on your guitar, on your DI, everything, make sure that you get a nice, good, decent signal. Anyway, back to the guitars. So let's check the other one. Now the other one, the other guitar is a little bit different because it actually plays a different part in the signal. In this one I'm using the Randall and I'm using two cabs, uh, the Marshall clone as well as a Mesa Boogie uh, 4x12 Celestian loaded. The Randall, this is I think the Warhead clone of the Randall. Um, it's got a really good tone, you don't actually need a drive pedal in front of it. I think I put a drive pedal in front of it to get a little bit more highs. Um, and as you can see here, also chopped off the bottom. As you can hear, with the with the um, using the full tone OCD as a tube screamer more. I can push up some of the highs a little bit and get the signal a bit cleaner um, and then using the majority of the drive actually comes from the Randall. And again I've chopped off the, the back end, uh, in the back end I've chopped off uh, a lot of the lows, the really low lows. So because I've made changes I'm now going to duplicate these. So that is now the second left and right are the same amps and these were panned 100%. So if we listen to the intro. Before we stop this one, we'll do the vocals completely separately. Now that we're far from finished, just so you guys know, there's going to be a lot more in the series. So, um, bass. What I'm looking for in the bass in this is again that kind of punchy bass with a slight bit of grit in it, um, but not overly distorted like you would have in certain metal um, genres. I wanted the transient to have a proper punch um, and I want even the lows to stand out quite nicely but not interfere with the bass drum. So we'll get to all of that later but let's first just look at the bass sound. So the first thing you'll notice about bass is uh, when you go looking into how to record bass and how to mix it, you'll notice that they say, okay, put the lows up, a nice deep depth, cut out all the meds and then push it up around the 3.5, um, 4 or 5 range, kind of like a bass drum in a way. I do it this way, I want my bass drum to hit that 50 60 hertz hard then have a nice transient over the 100 and then dip down and come back up by the 
5 as well for that click sound so that the bass drum is nice and defined. That means that the bass guitar has to be flipped. So in this case, in here, you'll notice that my 60, uh, which is usually 50 or 60 hertz, I drop all the way down, but I keep the 40, 20, 30, 40 hertz up and then bring it back up around 200, uh, around 100 and 180, and then only I start the dip, and then I bring it back up by the 5. So this is how the bass drum is set up. So it, it, the bass drum, uh, sorry, the bass uh, amp is set up. I've got quite a bit of gain, so it gets a bit of grit. What we'll do later on, we're going to duplicate this, mix it in with another amp. In fact, we'll do it right now because I actually have it set up already. But we're going to bus it and we're going to combine the two bass signals um, and compress them there and do the multiband compression on that to make it fit better. So this is now the other amp and guess what I've done here. This is a different amp altogether. So there's two things I quickly want to mention about Amplitude and using VSTs in this way. Number one, always make sure that you really crank up your volume, your master volumes in your amps. Amplitude does mimic the amp struggling, uh, the, the speaker struggling and the vibration of the cabs and all that. It, it does do that very well. So if you want to try and mimic the sound of an amp and a cab really loud, Put your masters up high. You can always bring um, the the master and the um, the other volumes down here. Okay. The other thing is that if you use them like this, depending on what amps you put in and what effects you put in, you might delay somewhat your um, your tracks kind of lag which means that you might get into phase issues so if you're running these two which are exactly the same signal if you're running them next to one another with different versions of amplitude they might shift in time so check your phase It sounds like flipping the phase does make a difference. Now you'll notice we've not done much to this just yet, but we will bust them and then we will um, EQ them together. Bring, mix the levels until we're happy and then we will EQ, compress and multiband compress them together to fit perfectly within the song later on. That's it for this episode. Next episode is... Um, what are we going to do the next episode? Yeah, next episode we will do the guitars in full. <laughs>